Okay, as promised, here is part two of our pre-reading lecture for Serna, um, in which I'll talk a little bit about the Mexican Revolution so we know the political context um, around the films that she is discussing. So the Mexican Revolution um, started during the rule of Porfirio Diaz. Um, and Porfirio Diaz took over power from Benito Juarez, who we are familiar with, um, because he is the person that overthrew um, Maximilian, who's featured in Manet's paintings, right? Um, so Porfirio Diaz um, establishes himself as a dictator, essentially, um, and he is interested in creating Mexico as a place that is open for business, that benefits um, himself and other members of the Mexican elite. Um, so what we see happening during his rule is that it's a period of heavy foreign investment and modernization. And so while those might not sound like the worst things in the world, what we see happening is that um, land is stripped from over 5 million individuals um, and that many peasants are placed back into essentially servitude, serfdom, um, on to the haciendas. So instead of people owning the land that they worked, um, they are now working um, for free um, on this hacienda system. Um, and so when we see foreign investment um, happening during this era, um, essentially what we are talking about is um, this kind of creation of a climate that is um, beneficial for big business um, and that negatively impacts um, the ability of um, poor folks to subsist. And so we see growing income inequality um, and right this kind of um, original sin of Diaz stripping 5 million people of the land that they worked. So as you might imagine, in the early 1900s, people are starting to get pretty mad. Um, they've lost their land. They've lost the ability to provide for their families. And so we see opposition to the Diaz regime first starting in the countryside. Um, so we see peasant groups that are being led by the folks that we may be most familiar with from the Mexican Revolution, Emiliano Zapata and Pancho Villa. Um, so we see these peasant groups um, starting a revolt in the countryside. And then we see that they are joined by labor unions um, and academics and intellectuals in the cities. Um, so we see folks in Mexico City being led by Francisco Madero. Okay, so big takeaways are Diaz's rule is corrupt and enriching the elite and the poor are sick and tired of it. And they're also sick and tired of someone who refuses to stand for um, re-election. So one of the things that happens when Madero um, takes power is that, um, whoops, sorry guys, um, is that he um, calls for an election, right? Demands an election um, as a kind of means through which to check Diaz's power. So in 1910, it looked like Madero was in fact going to win this election that was finally called for, and Diaz was not excited about that. And so Diaz um, imprisons Madero and imprisons a ton of his supporters as well. So Madero um, escapes and essentially says, look, you know, this guy is refusing to even stand for election. He's, you know, he's refusing to have his power checked in any way. He's not listening to reason. So now it's time for a full-scale rebellion against the Diaz dictatorship, right? Um, so Madero is able to facilitate um, the growth of this movement. And in 1911, um, we see Diaz being defeated. So Madero takes over, but unfortunately he proves to be relatively ineffective as a ruler. And he loses the support, importantly, of Emiliano Zapata. And he's also facing challenges from Diaz's nephew. So he's got trouble on all sides. He's not um, sort of fulfilling the promises that his coalition members are calling for. Um, and he's seeing um, challenges from other ends of the political spectrum as well from Diaz's nephew. So what we see happening here is the emergence of this general, right? So the military is also kind of part of this um, struggle over political power in Mexico as well. So um, Victoriano Huerta emerges as a leader and he both he defeats both Diaz and Madero. And what we also see happening here is that the United States intervenes. So they are putting their hand into um, this internal um, Mexican um, dispute. So this is as if, right, Mexico came into the Civil War and, uh, you know, fought 
um, on behalf of one of the sides fighting in the Civil War, right? So we're seeing this intervention of the United States into an internal um, Mexican conflict. Okay, so they help assassinate Madero. And then what we see happening here is that the United States is also not interested in Huerta um, retaining power as the leader of this new um, revolutionary Mexico. Um, so we see him being driven from power from an all-out invasion on the part of the United States to Veracruz. And if we know anything about Mexican geography, we know that Veracruz is noted for its oil reserves, right? So why is the United States interested in Veracruz? Because of its natural resource wealth, right? Okay. So we see Mexico um, sort of being invaded on the one hand in Veracruz, and then we see an internal conflict um, with Venus, uh, Venustiano Carranza, Villa Zapata, and others um, who are opposing Huerta as well. So in 1916, we see um, Carranza, Villa, and Zapata align themselves together and sort of redouble their commitment to the original um, aims of this revolution, which was to restore the land rights to um, those peasants who had been stripped of um, their subsistence and their land. And so we also see um, industrial workers joining this massive army um, led by Zapata Carranza and Villa march into Mexico City. Okay, so we see Carranza um, sort of establishing himself um, as um, the leader of this new coalition in 1916, and he promises to do the things that the revolution was supposed to do in the first place, right? On the one hand, to abolish um, foreign land ownership, and on the other hand, to break up the large haciendas and redistribute land to the folks who had been stripped of it in the first place. Um, this didn't happen, unfortunately, and so this coalition starts to fall apart. So Zapata is um, right representing um, the rural um, agrarian folks who are calling for this land reform that's not happening. And so they are becoming critical of Carranza not getting it done. And so Carranza feels threatened by Zapata and the discontent of his followers and assassinates Zapata. Okay, so then Zapata's loyalists are mad um, that Carranza has Zapata um, killed and they assassinate Carranza the following year. Okay. So then, after Carranza's death, um, Obregón takes power, um, and he had risen to power um, by defeating Villa. So again, we're thinking about this period of massive internal conflict um, in which coalitions come together, they fall apart, etc. Okay, so Obregón um, promises that he won't run for re-election, promises that um, he'll just serve one term, kind of get Mexico rolling in the right direction, and he wants to... Um, Additionally, right, um, make sure that um, this corruption that's associated with not having your power check doesn't um, happen under his rule. But what we see happening is that he um, gets comfortable and wants to run for re-election, and he is also assassinated. Um, so then Obregón, after his assassination, there's a series of conservative leaders um, that had absolutely nothing to do with the original goals of the Mexican Revolution, um, and so we see this kind of um, revolutionary politics of the um, uprising kind of being stymied for quite a while. So it's not until the mid-1930s that we see the election of Lázaro Cárdenas, um, who is a leader who is framing himself as a populist. Um, he's of indigenous descent, and we finally see the reforms that were um, the initial goal of the Mexican Revolution taking shape. So um, what we see happening here is that Cardenas actually accomplishes these agrarian reforms and redistributes almost, um, excuse me, more than half of Mexico's farmable land to um, the peasants who had been stripped of it and creating the system of ejidos, which is about collective ownership. So owning the land that you work. And what we see happening with regard to Mexico's natural resources is that he nationalizes the oil industry and kicks out foreign owners, right? So kicking out those American interests that um, had their ha had their eyes on on the oil reserves of Veracruz that we talked about earlier. Okay, so that's the Mexican Revolution. And take note of 1934 because the films that Serna talks about um, are emerging around that era. So the period that we call the Mexican Revolution is quite long, but we are looking at films that are rising and um, in popularity in this era towards the consolidation of the Mexican Revolution under the leadership of Lázaro Cárdenas. Okay, 
So when we're thinking about the Mexican Revolution, we want to think about it as a media event. Um, we want to think about how film and photography help a nation, both the Mexican nation and the United States to the north, um, remember this event, right? So some of the images that we're looking at here are some of the most iconic, right? With Zapata here um, and Pancho Villa here, and then, right, the landless um, individuals who started this revolution in the first place. So we want to keep in mind as we read Serna's article that film and photography are not passive media, right? They're not passive technologies, but they actively kind of manipulate and can transform um, national identity, national memory of an event. And so as we get into um, Serna's article, we want to keep that idea in mind. And we also want to keep in mind this tension between the United States and Mexico and how that plays out in these film representations of the Mexican Revolution. Okay. That's it, and I will see you all in our Zoom meeting. Thank you.